Hi, I'm Keith. Hi. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to throw so much stuff at you guys. I hope your minds are like donut amplified ready for you know accepting all that information. Okay. Um, so the topics are, yeah, kind of two pieces. I'm going to start talking about heuristics, um, uh, common approaches for prototyping, uh, and then also uh, a little bit of like, let's say you've got machine learning input coming in. How do I actually do something you know that's a good experience with that data? Um, and I want to talk uh, uh, about what I'm not talking about as well. So you know, you don't don't have wrong expectations. Uh, I'm not going to be doing any Swift or, or uh, uh, Cocoa stuff up here. Uh, I'm an interaction designer. My Swift is terrible. I can write some. It's not that good. You don't want to see it. Uh, I'm not going to teach you how to build an AI or ML, uh, you know, kind of system. Um, I'm not going to give introductions to prototyping. There's tons of good resources out there for for that stuff, and. Um, you know, I'm not going to be using Swift Playgrounds. And so if you can, that's great. I can't. Uh, lots of designers can't get in there and code stuff. So it'll, uh, it's great to use tools that many people can work together on in this kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm going to be doing some stuff using Framer. Uh, tools that are built for prototyping are fast. There's a lot, you know, they're hacky. They got all the right kind of animation stuff. Just it's, it's, there's no compile cycle. It's just built for, for, for that. So they tend to be a lot faster. Uh, and I, as I said, I really suck at you know Swift stuff, so you just have to deal with it. Um, a bit about me. Okay, so uh, I'm a guy who's worked on uh, a bunch of applications. Um, initially, I was actually apparently the first DevWorld talk keynote ever, uh, talking about software uh, called Comic Life when software came in a box. I don't know if you ever seen a box before. <laughs> um, they used to put software in it somehow. Um, so I'm a bit like, you know, like this guy. Um, uh, anyway, so I'm one of the guys behind Skitch, which was an app which got acquired by Evernote. And we uh, went and built a whole bunch of versions. You know, there's a whole backstory there. But um, I got experience and kind of this immersion to a whole bunch of devices. Uh, we did, you know, Apple liked us. I think we did OK. Uh, and um, from there, I went on and did a bunch of other work in spaces, including autonomous uh, home security drones uh, and uh, Internet of Things, smart home stuff. So I've, I've, I've had the good fortune to be exposed to a lot of platforms and uh, so a little bit of hardware and, and a, lot of, a lot of software. Uh, what I'm currently working on, too, is, is, a, is tools for remote work and also some other really cool developer tools. I'd love you guys to like, come and find me and say, I want to get early access to this stuff. Please come and find me. Um, OK. So, uh, you, you've got some crazy idea. Um, there's going to be some fudging. Uh, you've come to this talk. Uh, what is the fudge factor? Um, this is usually how it gets kind of defined. It's ad hoc. Um, it's a made up value or it's a made up kind of thing. Um, and it includes things like Einstein's cosmological constant. And if it's good enough for Einstein, it's like good enough for me. <laughs> uh, OK, so why would you want to prototype stuff? The first one is you just got some crazy idea. Mm, oh man, I wonder if they would even work. Uh, the second one is kind of escalating. OK, so uh, it kind of works. Let's fine tune it. How do we do that quickly? How do we iterate on it quickly? Uh, you might need to communicate this to a fellow developer, or you're a designer, communicate developer, or somebody else inside your team. So it's a communication tool as well. Prototype is worth, I think they say a million words, is, is, is the joke. Uh, or you need to pitch this to a CEO or uh, you know, venture capitalist or something like that, where you need to say, look, we want to build this thing, um, and it's going to look kind of like this. So that's the kind of reasons why you do it. Uh, when I was looking at those, those uh, historical photos, I came across this, like, if we ever think we have a hard job, this guy, his job is to sit on top of a helicopter, and he's got these like, little handlebars for safety. Anyway, I thought that was funny. Um, OK, why not prototype something? Uh, there's tons of best practices. For, for stuff like if you're like going, oh, I'll just fudge it because I you know, couldn't be bothered. Look, please do, do look it up. Um, there's a, there's, there's a you know, Apple Hig probably article or a page on something you, you, you're working on. Um, it's really expensive to iterate something to a really high quality result. It's a, it takes a long time. Um, and sometimes an organization just doesn't have the patience for that. Uh, 
And sometimes somebody's done something else before. Uh, and you should go and just copy what they've done if you think it works. Um, and just in terms of um, uh, fudge factory stuff, I mean, things like spacing around a, a local, this is the old, old branding of Evernote, but you know, this is a, a branding document and branding guidelines. And you know, like the, the spacing comes from the letter height and stuff. Like th there are all manner of best practices that you might know even exist. Um, and this is a really cool tip that you should like go ah and like type something into something because you you can go and use the test other people's stuff like we did this a whole bunch you know like we're doing um, styles management within the, the document right so like I you know there's a header or whatever which works best okay we can just send users user testing it to Google Docs and medium and n number of other things and you can just get empirical data that says hey this task is completed fastest or most successfully and you hadn't didn't have to build a thing so you can get empirical data, data by just testing other people's stuff and that's another reason not to prototype okay so you've decided um, you want to build something and uh, I built a whole bunch of stuff and often there's kind of two approaches one is you handcraft some stuff, you build a little state model, uh, state machine, sorry. Um, and uh, the other approach is kind of machine learning stuff and then sometimes you mix them and so forth. So I'm gonna start off talking about this kind of stuff. Um, the best interfaces augment or extend a human gesture. Uh, all of these tools that we, we're familiar with and, and tools going back as far as a spear and the stone axe, they take a motion and they make it more precise, or they make it reach further. Uh, they, make it, um, they make it be amplified in force or in speed. They're all about taking an existing gesture and extending it. So, so great interfaces do that. So if we're, our ideas around that space, um, that's a good thing to keep in mind. And Apple really agrees with, with this approach, right? Things that are, seem like physical things, like they have maybe a spring, uh, two springs and you know like the, the mechanism is like a physical thing uh, we're very good at understanding it and um, relating to it and working with it and and becoming comfortable with it so uh, f becoming something like a physical model is a very uh, practical approach okay the most iconic is the scroll view right it's kind of made the iPhone actually work as a device uh, and it's got a bunch of great properties to it so it's got elastic banding um, and what's happening there is they're taking the input value and they're multiplying it by 0 0.5. And then that's what they're, they're moving the view by. Uh, and that's, oh, not the view, sorry, but the view contents. And that tells the user continuously that, yes, I understand your intention. I can't deliver on that intention. We, we've run out of stuff to scroll. Um, so it's, it's, it's incredibly valuable. Um, the other thing it does is, is has a momentum scroll. So, uh, we're very good in real life at throwing balls and spears and stuff. We're very good at taking uh, a vector and extrapolating it mentally and knowing we're going to hit something or even the ability to just move quickly uh, because we know we can throw something, let go, and it'll keep going. Um, it, there's also acceleration in, in, in the most recent versions of this where they take uh, an existing view that's moving and saying if you perform that same kind of gesture we're going to accelerate that even more you have the superhuman strength to accelerate so that the, there's this kind of augmentation and extension on extension okay so uh a paginated view is, is another uh, good example similar stuff happening right um there's an input that's being mapped here but this is this has got uh, the same kind of discoverability to it and it's got this, this uh, forgivability to it, right? If I don't go far enough, it, it gradually kind of moves back to where it was. And I get a sense that I need to go f further. So it's really, that's a really important property. Um, and there's a discrete result. And this is really common in design that whatever your system is doing, you want a discrete result as, you know, it needs to be A or B, on or off, so forth. So. Um, Th this is, a, this is a, a good example of that. Okay, so heuristics are this like state machine. It's a little bit like a physical object. And um, often they have all this kind of stuff coming in. Um, often there's a state machine that's uh, m kind of managing or understanding the state of the user or emulating it. 
Um, and then there's a whole bunch of benefits of, of, of this approach. Uh, there's no special tools to, to build these kind of things. Usually it's just plain old code in whatever you're doing and not a lot of code. Um, they're very performant. You know, they're great for running on, on kind of devices when you have written a couple of little bits of logic code and a simple state machine. Uh, you can run on small devices. They're not going to take a lot of CPU or GPU. And when they're done right there, they're kind of the ingredients for your secret sauce, right? They might be the thing that makes your device work better than anybody else's or your app work better than anybody else's. The problem is that they're slow to develop, to fine tune. It takes a lot of time. Um, because often uh, it, you, you just have to live with it to get a sense of it. Um, they have limited capabilities. They, they can't detect, you know, a cat, right? Building that out of heuristics is like basically impossible. Um, and you have to defend them from management who's coming and going, you're just mucking around with stuff, right? No, 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 I'm building something important here. Yeah, no, no, you're just like tweaking values and stuff. So that's, that's a downside. Okay, so I, I want to like go through this stuff from the very kind of most basic. And the most basic I could think of was a keyboard. Like it's just an on-off switch, right? It's like up, down, electrical contact. Can't be that complex. But it um, turns out uh, it is. When a key comes down, it bounces a bunch of times. So you get a noisy input. So all switches, and this has gone back for decades and decades and decades in your analog uh, phone switching systems and stuff have a debounce circuit. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's saying anything after that first down for about five milliseconds, I'm going to ignore. And the, and the, the kind of logic looks like this. Um, there's probably other ways of saying it, but I, th I think you understand what I'm saying here. Um, my point is we are surrounded in these kinds of machines. If we look at nature, we might say, oh, here's the same thing, right? Does anyone know what these things are? They, they, a fly comes in and goes and eats the fly, right? Um, they got these little hairs on them, right? That the fly touches the hair and it makes it close. Uh, actually, this is, it's really more complex than this, but it's kind of solving the same problem. Here's the state machine for that thing. Um, if, if one hair gets tapped, it doesn't close. It needs to count two hairs within 20 seconds. Really sophisticated stuff. And then it has this whole set of stuff, right? So like, uh, was there a touch? No, I'm going to ignore that. It was just uh, like a leaf or breeze or something. OK, it happened again. I'm going to guess that's a, a fly. I'm going to close the trap. Now I'm going to wait and see whether they th count three touches within one minute. Um, yeah, it's because the fly is like trapped and so forth and go through the step of um, digesting the fly. Because it's quite expensive to the plant to, to run this whole system, right? Um, and just like the stuff we build, it's expensive to build software. It's expensive to release software. It's, it, it's, it's expensive to build hardware and release hardware. Um, so, so my point is that, that um, nature is, and, and, and the systems we have are always, they're more sophisticated than you might think they are by default. And that's because they're dealing with a lot of noise. The world is noisy. Um, even at its lowest level. You know, the false negatives is a thing we often think about. Hey, it didn't trigger when it should have. Uh, but the, the false positive is actually the one that you often have to really think about, where you get lots of false positives, like in the case of the, the down switch on the key, it's everything after that first one. Or in, in the case of the, the fly trap, it's um, only after the first one. Okay. So we're surrounded in sensors. We've got, we've got these phenomenal amounts of like, data available to us. Um, all kinds of um, uh, sensors and sensors. Uh, and Apple's great at dealing with this stuff. And you know, that's kind of one of their secret sources. So um, has anyone got AirPods? Anyone know? Yeah, so if you, pull, if you pull one AirPod out when it's playing, it will pause playback. If I pull a second one out, it, it won't play it, start resume playing until I put them back in. Um, but if I put one back in within a minute, it'll resume playback. It's actually really nice, right? It's that whole, hey, what was that? Yeah, okay, put it back in and you're, and you're on your way. And this is like the secret source stuff that Apple's really, really good at. Um, looking at an example, uh, the Mac dock, we all, we're all familiar with it, so it's a great example. Uh, the dock, you, you can drag an icon out to, to, to remove it from the dock. But there's this kind of area of safety there. So um, 
it, again, it's kind of a state machine. It also has time to, if you do that very quickly, uh, it says, no, not enough time has elapsed. I'm going to put that back in. You must have accidentally clicked and dragged, and I don't want you to accidentally remove your doc item. Um, so it's, it's got uh, discrete outcomes, which we talked about. It's got a safe zone, this kind of idea of forgiveness that we, that we talked about. And it's, it's got a time aspect too, as well, which is, which is um, in this case, for kind of a safety aspect. So I want to go to a little prototype that I built in Framer and uh, talk a little bit about prototyping these kinds of systems. So this is Framer. Anyone ever heard of Framer? A couple of hands at the back there. Yeah, okay. So Framer is this really popular tool. Uh, your designers often use it. Um, it is code. It's CoffeeScript. Don't hate me. Uh, but designers like the simplicity of CoffeeScript. And uh, they're actually moving to like proper JavaScript and so forth. Anyway, the beauty of tools like this, and I'll show you some other ones, is that you know, there's no compile cycle. As soon as I type, it, the view is updated, like it's instantaneous. I don't know if I have to refresh or anything like that. Um, and I could just do things like drop in graphics and all kinds of stuff, right? Um, so here's a little model of that doc. So I've got, a, I've got an item, I'm pulling it out. There's a safe zone and it goes back in, right? So there's a bunch of states that I've kind of just set up here. Uh, and if I go further, I get, I get a, uh, a, a popover overlay. If I release, you know, it disappears. So um, I'm not going to go through the code, but it's, it's, it's not too much code, um, given that it's actually quite a complex little model. Um, and, and having something like this lets you think about, here's a version where I've, I've started to think more continuously, right? So as I drag out of the dock, um, the doc, other dock items are closing as I'm dragging out, right? So um, if we wanted to say, hey, it's better to be more continuous, maybe the dock should work like this, right? So these kind of systems are, are, are easy for people to work with and they're very fast to work with. So even if you're not like, man, I'm not touching CoffeeScript, it's still worth a look just for a prototyping tool. I'd, I'd highly recommend it. And certainly any designers, go and check it out. Um, because you also do have the whole kind of design aspect where I can just draw, add, you know, copy and paste stuff from Sketch and so forth. And, and in this case, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just using um, uh, you, Parts of the parts of the view as as kind of indications where like after this buffer here, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, after this buffer here is where I want I want it to delete if I release. Right. So it can be very fast to just I'm not changing even values here. I'm just dragging a rectangle around. Um, so it can be a very fast way to work. Okay. So um, for hu for heuristics and gestural design, these are three of my favorite dub dub videos. I uh, highly recommend you take a look. And they, they really, Apple's really getting into this kind of continual interface. Um, the more continual you can provide feedback to your user, the, the better. The more, more they will understand, the more they will accidentally discover. Um, so I highly recommend these ones. And I wanted to talk a little bit about time. Um, let's say we had an interaction where it has one second um, timer, right? We've, and we've kind of optimized for one second because we've set it at one second. The problem is that all our initial users are coming in uh, and it's, it's happening too fast for them, so they're surprised. But then they get used to it and they're happy, but then over time they want it to go faster. Right? So there's kind of this inverse curves uh, and you're kind of fighting against this natural progression of the user getting better and better at using your app. Um, accessibility is also important to think about uh, when you're designing these kinds of systems uh, because uh, not everyone can drag something out easily, right? So the dock, for example, has multiple methods of deleting from it. You can drag to the trash. Uh, you can right click and just say, remove item. Uh, there's also a cost of gesture recognizers. So you can't just pile these kind of things up. They're not, not even gest gesture recognizer, but like gestural systems. So, you know, a single click is great. And then you say, hey, we should support uh, we should support double tap as well. Well, now it needs to wait about 250 milliseconds to make sure that, that any first tap wasn't actually also going to be a double tap. And so you get this latency added. And then, you know, triple tap and so forth. So um, it's worth thinking about what, 
what any other system has to do underneath the hood to make to make it that possible because it, it can kind of uh, really impact it, the, the latency. Um, and these systems, uh, these systems are, are not necessarily kind of time-based systems. So this is an uh, arrow in our annotation tool. Uh, so you can see it's dynamic as the user is drawing it out or resizing it. The, the head is resizing to always kind of look appropriate and then it kind of reaches a maximum constraint and everything else just continues. So quite a complex system. Um, and again, a bunch of kind of fuzzy factors. Um, really hard to prototype without actual code, but you can kind of do it now. We couldn't do it back then. Um, but the point is that not all systems are kind of time-based or like flow-based. Some of them are going to be how things lay out. <coughs> OK. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools you might choose to use. Um, Click-through stuff is really common, like even the most, uh, ev even the core drawing products like Sketch apps, like Sketch, give you click-through prototyping. This is where you can say, when I click on this element, I want to navigate to this element. Um, so super common. So if you're doing something like that, you know, um, Figma, I haven't put there, but any of these ones here, that's, that's a good match for those. Um, if you're doing something where it's more dynamic, but it's still a relatively fixed system, so something uh, does here, something here, and it maps to a different value in a few different places, like something scales down and it also, uh, you know, loses its drop shadow as you drag it upwards and this kind of thing. Um, principle, Pixate and Hype are good tools for that. Uh, if it is very stateful, there isn't very much like Framer at the moment. It really is the, the killer solution for anything that gets into the complexity that only code can handle. Um, but if you are doing video or media heavy stuff and it's a simple thing you're trying to prototype. Um, something like Quartz Composer or Origami Studio by Facebook. Uh, and there's a few other things like Vue. Um, it's, they're kind of a dying breed of nodal based programming apps. So I can show you, I will show you a little bit about what they look like. Um, but they can do things like, I just want to pipe video to here and give me the average color and that's going to control this. And you know, there's like four patches and you're, you're up and running in real time. Ah, yes. So here's an example of uh, like, you know, a, there's a tap and it switches and there's a transition, right? And, and the background changes. But the truth is you, you like tend to end up with this. Um, this is a real patch of mine, you know, so uh, at some point in time it went like that. Um, this is your kind of principal uh, aspect or uh, hype, you know, we have multiple views and you have kind of relationships between them uh, and drivers and so forth. Uh, and then there's things like Framer and this is Framer X, which is the upcoming thing where they've done kind of modules and it's all uh, React under the hood. Um, and you can do things like drop in a Spotify player right in your you know, a visual editor uh, and it will work, stuff like that. Um, so a lot of people are getting excited about this stuff. So these are some of my favorite ones. Um, and uh, you can always swap tools. There's a lot of like, a lot of them are free. Uh, that like Pixate, I mean, sorry, um, uh, Origami, um, Quartz Composer. Um, yeah, always, always try switching tools. Okay. Uh, wow. I'm at like 25 minutes? No, I'm, I'm gonna go through this quickly. Okay. Years 1997, two significant things happened. Um, Steve Jobs came back to Apple. Apple's stock hit an all-time low. Uh, and there's one more thing that happened that was really significant computing. Uh, this guy. <laughs> <coughs> so it's Clippy, if anyone doesn't know him, know him, which is like this little character that appeared uh, when you're working on a document. And why was he so annoying? Um, he was unexpected. There's kind of this uncanny valley stuff. If you don't know that phrase, it means something that's kind of like a human, but not really and annoying. Um, and he added work because he's kind of distracted you and asked you to do work and like he didn't, he didn't do smart things. Um, he's still in the office, but he's in a different department now. Uh, I like that. One. Um, okay, so benefits, AI can be mind-blowing. It's really cool. I mean, that might mean you get venture capital or people in your team 
because of it, and it's the future, obviously. Um, the downside of it is it can have really high confidence in something that's wrong. Um, it's costly to train and to run uh, on, on your device. That's getting better and better, but it's still kind of the case, and, and often still over-promises, or at least there's like this more hope than it, it delivers in the real world. Um, so for example, here's me looking, running a ML5 thing on this, and yeah, it's a banana, but like the next guesses are like, like this far from crazy. It's, it's kind of like you have this little dog and it's lovely, but it occasionally just barks at the wall for no reason. Um, AI is a bit like that. Okay, so um, I kind of think of it as a trust level thing with AI. You got this kind of lowest trust where you might just think, well, I'm gonna use it for like choosing what to cache next. It's better than random. Um, low, you might say that um, I'm gonna use it for uh, setting the default. Right, so the, the default thing before someone goes and edits it, or the ranking on some search even. Um, high, it might be a prompt and an ignorable, and if it's super high, you just kind of would walk someone into it and then say, hey, we did this thing for you, and you can undo it if you want to. So I was imagining this kind of banana, yeah, app. It's gonna be this social app. Um, it's gonna solve the problem of like Twitter, or it's all too much, you know, it's hate and what we just wanted to share is bananas, pictures of bananas. Um, okay, so it's, it's kind of social good, it's helped people eat their banana at the right time, not let them go off, there's some machine learning, so it's going to, sure, it's going to be blockchain, whatever. Okay, <laughs> and there's going to be TED Talk too. Okay, so you take a picture of a banana, uh, yep, I'll use that photo, and then, and then you say, how ripe is the banana, okay? And then you share it off to the world. Okay, so this is like machine learning is not basically trust, trustworthy at all at this point. Another version of this, you've got your v version two, it's some machine learning that's okay. So you'd start with uh, taking a picture, use that photo, this time I'm gonna set the default, I'm gonna set the preset. They can always change it and they can see it right there. But this is a really good fit for a lot of machine learning uh, where it is now. Uh, okay, version three comes, you've got even better machine learning. This time we're gonna set um, the default, we're not going to expose it to them anymore, but they can see it. Um, and we just kind of say, look, we got this, but you can go and edit it if you want to. Okay. Um, you could do the same thing with, for example, finding, let's say, get sophisticated enough to know where the banana is. You just want people just to share the banana. You don't want them having some other thing behind the banana to confuse the message. So an initial version of this, you might just ask people to please, you know, highlight the banana. If you're a bit better, you could say like, well, we've highlighted the banana for you as a default, but please go ahead and continue you know, cleaning it up and then, and, then, uh, and then say you're done. But in a really, really sophisticated model, uh, you might just say, look, we've cut out the banana. And, and if you want to go and, like if we didn't get it just right, you can go and edit it, but you know, assume that you've got it right. So this kind of scaling of, of the trust of the AI. Um, so we did this in a whole bunch in an app called Scannable. We built a big machine learning uh, system that ran on the GPU on the phone. So when you took a picture, uh, we knew a whole bunch of stuff. Like we knew that this was a business card, for example. We'd go and look up the details on LinkedIn and a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, and and the, the most valuable stuff we'd get uh, would be these kind of sets, these enums, right? So saying what, what Instead of trying to understand this very broad idea, what's these small sets of stuff we can have machine learning help us quantify into? And that's incredibly valuable for UI because you can make decisions based on it. You can do things like set the default file name. Now it just says receipt. It doesn't just say document, right? And that's actually very valuable. It saves people time. They're like, receipt, that's a fine enough name for me. S send or save. Um, uh, yeah, and you can do all kinds of optimization once you, once you understand that stuff, and that's a whole other topic. Uh, and actually, AI can, when it's too fast, you want to start combining it with heuristics. So for example, here we're capturing, uh, this is just a mock, but we eventually built all this stuff, of course. Um, we needed to slow it down artificially, because we were, we were capturing images before people were kind of visually ready for, or emotionally ready for it almost. Um, and so often ML you want to combine with actual heuristics to say, can we, get, can we keep it in the reasonable um, you know, uh, sanity, essentially? Um, I'm gonna, how are we for time? Uh, we have five minutes. Okay. 
Wow. You can buy the book of this talk if you'd like. <laughs> um, yeah, so prototyping AI is really, um, uh, in terms of machine vision, is there's no good solution out there at the moment aside from going and building apps, right? Um, it's getting close. So here's a couple of solutions where you can plug Framer into some of these external things. Uh, do not dismiss faking it. So here's me. Uh, I've built an app where it just watches the accelerometer. When accelerometer is still for a while, I, I show a little notification message, right? It gives you enough of the feel to start to design for something that produces machine learning results. You'll find all the problems like, hey, it shows me stuff when it's lying flat down on the desk. Or I, what happens when I have multiple things come in? Um, I mean, you can just fake it completely. Here's just me. You know, literally hit a key and it, and it will send on, on the device you know, that have this event. Um, so stuff like this, really, really fast to prototype and actually very valuable. And even though it's puppetry, it's, you totally get a lot of value out of it. Um, when you're prototyping, always try to prototype on the device. You know, Frame allows you to do that. The other, many of the other tools let you do that. Um, and when you're presenting stuff, well, let's go through this. But like, use some fruit, use some cats. You have nice images. Use nice device images. You can get these from uh, Facebook. Um, and uh, GIFs are great. Like if you're doing, if you're a designer and you're working with engineers, put GIFs into Jira tickets. So um, scale your UI to match real world performance. You probably want to map heuristics and machine learning together. Uh, that gets you sane performance. It's not the crazy dog, right? It's, it's now kind of got some sanity. And there's many approaches to prototyping. Choose between many of the tools. Sometimes fake it until you make it if you need to. Thank you, guys. Um, please do come say hello. I'd, lo I'd, love to, I'd love to share some of this cool alpha stuff I'm working on. Thanks for listening.